Edward Acorn has been a lifelong reader of Abraham Lincoln. In 2020, he published his first book on the 16th president called Every Drop of Blood, subtitled The Momentous Second Inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. In his second book, just published, On Lincoln, Mr. Acorn dropped back to the beginning of Honest Abe's national political career. That year was 1860. The subject matter, inside the Republican convention held in Chicago. This time the book is titled The Lincoln Miracle. Edward Acorn is the former editorial page editor of the Providence Journal and lives in Rehoboth, Massachusetts. Ed Acorn, you have a quote from Frederick Douglass in your book on the 1860 political convention in Chicago. You say, he said at the time, without Chicago, we should have no wigwam. Without the wigwam, we should have no Abraham Lincoln. Without a Lincoln, we might have had today no government. Who was Frederick Douglass and what is the wigwam? Yes, Frederick Douglass is a great black leader, former slave, um, and he uh, was very prominent in the 1860s. He was not very friendly to Lincoln at the start, interestingly enough. The wigwam was the convention hall built by the Republicans of Chicago to host their 1860 convention. And they called it the wigwam because uh, Indian names were being used for uh, uh, political operations in those days. Um, so it's it's a great building. It was it's seated. It filled about 11,000 people could uh, crowd into it. And uh, Bruce Bruce Catton said it was probably the greatest fire trap ever built in America because it was made of wood. It had uh, um, evergreens hung by the ladies of Chicago to decorate it, bunting. And you can imagine with the gas lights flaring in that building <laughs> what, it, what it was like. Bruce Catton, you say uh, your dad introduced you to that historian. Tell us about that. Yeah, when I was a kid, my dad gave me the his uh, centennial history on the Civil War, three volumes, and I just was so stunned by the writing and by what I learned about Lincoln in those books and what I learned about this great tragedy, the Civil War, and it, it really affected me um and i wrote two books about 19th century baseball before i got to lincoln and finally had the courage to do a book about lincoln why do you say courage <laughs> well i mean any anybody looking at the 19th century the uh, i think the greatest figure of the 19th century is abraham lincoln there's been uh something like eighteen thousand books published about him that's I'm told that's more than anybody except Jesus Christ. So that's uh, it, it's when you feel like you can add something to that pile that's distinctive. It's rather, rather daunting. Why did you start with the book on his second inaugural address? Yeah, I've the second inaugural address is just I think it's Lincoln's uh, most wonderful speech. It's um, he speaks of uh, with malice toward none, with charity for all. And this is at the end of this terrible, horrible, unpopular war. And I was always just struck by this speech. I mean, how, how could uh, any politician deliver that speech at the end of the war? Um, so I, I, I started looking intensely into that day in that speech and i noticed all these famous people kept coming in and out of uh the story that day including frederick douglas we just mentioned who saw lincoln speaking and then uh, later uh, met with him at the white house at a reception that night um uh, walt whitman the great american poet was covering it for the covering the inaugural for the new york times uh, john wilkes booth who killed Lincoln six weeks later, was stalking him at the inauguration. And I think he wanted to kill him that day. And, uh, you know, Salmon P. Chase, his former Treasury Secretary, who tried to knock him off as president, uh, 
politically. <laughs> he was administering the oath oath of office to Lincoln. So all these, and, and you know, Andrew Johnson, who was uh, who succeeded Lincoln as president was there as uh, the vice president elect and he was embarrassingly drunk. So all these wonderful stories and perspectives on the war um, through these people. And I just thought that was a, a great way to confront that day. Uh, look at these different people interacting with Lincoln and look at Lincoln himself and what it says about where America was on that really landmark day. You're a man of words, a newspaper man, a writer. What does it say that two of his most famous speeches, Gettysburg was 271, 272 <laughs> words, and this speech you wrote about was 701 words. What's it say about length? Yeah, it, it, well, it says in the hands of a master craftsman of the English language, which Lincoln was, you can convey some pretty profound ideas in a very brief space. I mean, I think Lincoln's up there with any American writer, which is an extraordinary thing, since he was self-educated. He just basically he studied uh, the Bible and the works of William, some of the works of William Shakespeare, and developed this flair for language that is extraordinary, uh, so sonorous, so uh, and filled with Lincoln's pragmatic perception of human nature um he had a very biblical understanding that human beings are flawed creations but they're also they also have a divinity in each each person and how, that's an extraordinary thing how did you educate yourself from the very beginning from bruce catton on <laughs> about abraham and what what age were you when you got the books from your dad Ooh. I, uh, I think I was a young teenager or 12 or something like that. Um, and I just, I just read, I mean, I, I'm just fascinated in, uh, history. I'm fascinated in old newspapers and I love getting to original documents and digging in and seeing what people at the time said. And, uh, but I mean, uh, I've uh, read the great writers about Lincoln, Douglas Wilson, who I greatly admire, um, James McPherson, um, you know, on and on. Uh, I've really, uh, I've studied Lincoln because he's so fascinating. He's so human. He's had, he had so many defeats en route to this very improbable nomination I write about in the new book um and and uh, so he's he's just a wonderful figure and i think it, people agree because they keep wanting to read about him you also in both books talk about j william mittendorf the <laughs> second and the reason i bring him up is he's still alive uh, i remember he him is. Like, 96 or something like I, that i went to his 98th birthday last summer so he's still going strong still and he's very sharp and smart why do you mention him in your acknowledgments I, I just had the opportunity to meet him and um and to start talking to him about presidential politics and he he was on, <laughs> on the cabinet so we saw it up close and i think he shaped my understanding of what went on at this convention in a way because he he, he gave me an idea of what uh, power politics are like at the highest level he was navy secretary at one time yes what, <clears throat> what do you make of his quote life is relationships politics is compromise well i think lincoln would agree with that quote uh, as well i mean uh lincoln was a, a man who built relationships and sustain them and that's that's what lifted him to the top um i mean i love i love lincoln because one of the reasons i love lincoln is he he had this uncanny ability to brush off personal attacks and he, he would look at the the long game i mean it does he always felt it didn't uh pay off politically to take offense and uh, attack someone, which is very alien to today's politics, obviously. 
And he was right. A lot of the people who had uh, confronted him and clashed with him later became uh, effective allies. And uh, that's something we could all learn from, I think. What was this country like when he was being considered or not considered in around the 1860 era? Yeah, this this was a very bitterly divided country. Um, the, the people of the South, the leaders of the South especially, were uh, very threatened by the rise of this young party, the Republican Party, which was devoted to stopping the spread of slavery and eventually ending slavery. Uh, and they found this a terrible thing that this country founded with protections for slavery was now embracing this rising party that attacked slavery. Um, and there had been just uh, very painful experiences. Uh, in 1859, John Brown, who was a militant abolitionist, had raided an armory in uh, Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and, and had planned to equip slaves with guns to kill their white masters. And this sent a uh, just horror through the South and even in the North, uh, people were thinking, we really have to stop all this talk about slavery. Uh, it's putting an unbearable strain on the system. If we don't watch out, we're gonna have a very bloody civil war. So all this played into what was going on in uh, 1860 at the convention. But, uh, you know, uh, William Seward, who was the was a superstar of the Republican Party and had, uh, had made some very uh, strong statements against slavery and warning that slavery and freedom could not coexist forever in this country. And that had panicked the South and a lot of people in the North thought, wow, uh, this guy's uh, too, too extreme. He's saying things that are very dangerous and so that was uh, part of the factors that the delegates had to weigh when they were in Chicago in 1860. There's a very human story you tell about Seward doing a tour of the United States campaigning. Now, this is after 1860, when his train ends up, I believe, in Springfield, Illinois. And But, but give us the, the background on that and what yeah. happened. Well. When Seward, when uh, Lincoln won the nomination, Seward's supporters were just devastated, and they thought this is a joke. This convention, how dare they choose this rail splitter, uh, who had virtually no executive experience other than running a two-man law office, over Seward, who had was the former governor of New York, the most populous and powerful state, and he had been a U.S. Senator, and he had met with foreign leaders. So he, he, obviously Seward had greater experience uh, than Lincoln did. Um, and so during the campaign, Lincoln kept reaching out to Seward. You've got to come, come to Springfield, meet with me, let's have a talk. And Seward refused to do it. He kept putting it off. And finally, he condescended to stop his train in Springfield at the station en route to Chicago for a big speech he was going to make. And uh, Lincoln had to wait at the platform, on the platform, for the great man to arrive. And then he had to fight his way into the railroad cars to reach Seward. And uh, Seward very chilly and politely introduced him to his uh, fellow travelers. And then he sat down. And that was just a snub of Lincoln. And uh, that was their, their great meeting. And it's, um, to, to me, it says a lot about uh, both men, how their relationship proceeded. Because Lincoln did not take offense. He, he, he named Seward his Secretary of State, which was the most important cabinet position. And after Lincoln became president, Seward still thought he was the power behind the throne. He thought that Lincoln was not up to the job of president and that he would secretly run the administration. And even a month into uh, Lincoln's administration, Seward uh, 
wrote him this famous note saying, you know, uh, we don't have any policy as an administration. We've got to start doing some things. Uh, someone has to take control uh, and be willing to do these things. I, you know, I don't have to do it, but I'd be willing to do it, you know, that kind of thing. And Lincoln um, sort of put him in his place. He responded to him in a written letter that I don't think he gave to Seward because it's in Lincoln's papers. And he went and spoke to Seward. And within a few months, Seward had changed his tune. He was saying, he was writing to his wife, this this man is the best of all of us. He's he's an incredible executive. And Seward became Lincoln's um, closest friend and ally during that war. It just, he was invaluable to him in uh, getting through that war. And I think that says something about both men. But where does Abraham Lincoln get this ability to be snubbed and not have it impact him. For instance, General McClellan snubbed him yes. during the Civil War. Of course, he beat him in the next election, <laughs> but he but he went to his house and he wouldn't. He refused to come downstairs. I mean, what? How did he get through this kind of thing? I don't know how he did it. I mean, it it may have been related to his upbringing, which was very poor. He uh, and his repeated defeats in what he tried to accomplish. Seward, by comparison, was the boy wonder governor of New York. He had he had been an extraordinary success in almost everything he touched. Lincoln had a very hard struggle. And I think that was part of uh, his his ability to sort of brush off these slights. He would he would just focus on the long term. But this is I mean, to me, this is the most extraordinary thing about Lincoln. I can't, it's so hard to do. I mean, in this age, I, you know, I personally, you know, I, I post things on Twitter and I get violently attacked or whatever I, di I did when I was a journalist. And, you know, you feel like responding and you have to think of as Lincoln thought, and I don't know how he did it, especially with the power he eventually had. And he, he refused to, punish his enemies he he wanted to cultivate relationships and to me I, it's a mystery to me ultimately how he had that talent he could step out of himself and just look at this uh, look at what will serve me in the long run what what will serve the country and this uh, you know even advised mary lincoln his wife to to try that approach with very limited success. Go back to the 1860 Chicago-based, wigwam-based uh, convention. How did he win? Yeah, he went in there as the longest of long shots. Um, on May 12th, 1860, which is the day the book begins, Harper's Weekly ran a center spread on the candidates, and they had Lincoln sort of uh, in the corner with the also rans and they had write-ups of the candidates and Lincoln was dead last among those. So he was really the darkest of the, the dark horses. People were talking about him uh, primarily as a possible vice presidential nominee because Illinois was a very important swing state. And uh, so, but, and, but I, as I mentioned earlier, Seward had these sort of flaws that uh, were not immediately apparent. He, Seward came in with the money, the, the most delegates. Uh, he had an extraordinary um, campaign manager, Thurlow Weed, who was a very prominent guy in Albany. And he made and broke presidents and senators. He was a very powerful guy. And he brought, he used all his money to bring thousands of people to Chicago to sort of march in the streets and send a very strong message that this was Seward's convention. But there were, these were, one of the things I learned researching this book very quickly is that these delegates meeting in Chicago were not interested in choosing the, the what they thought was the best president to deal with a, a national crisis. They were interested in which one would get us the most votes which would drag the most Republicans into positions of power and local elections. And they were worried about Seward. Seward had 
was associated with a sort of radicalism about uh, not only um, slavery but immigration. He had he he was very um, uh, sensitive towards immigrants. He was friendly with the Catholic bishop of of New York City. He was, and and that was that alarmed some some aspects of the Republican Party. Uh, they had many anti-immigrant people uh, in their ranks. So they had to look for somebody who wasn't as famous as Seward, who could, who, although Lincoln espoused the same values towards immigrants and slavery as Seward did, but he wasn't as famous. So he was more electable with swing voters. And it's extraordinary how this this all played out. I, I, I write in the book about it almost hour by hour during that week, uh, how things shifted and everything slotted into place perfectly for Lincoln. And one of my favorite things about this convention is it started on Wednesday, which was Seward's 59th birthday. It was a Seward convention uh, from the perspective of the public and the press. On Thursday, Seward won, Seward's team won a whole series of test votes. Uh, so he seemed really poised to win the nomination. And later that evening, uh, they were ready to start voting for president. And if they had done that, I think Seward would have won. Uh, but they didn't have the tally sheets at the rostrum available. And they said it'd be about five minutes. And the delegates were hungry. And rather than... Uh, hang around for the tally sheets, they adjourned to the next day, expecting Seward would be nominated the next day. And it was during that night that Lincoln's men really w were able to uh, make him the alternative to Seward and actually get the support he needed to win. And this is, this is I mean, when you look at our country, it, it hangs on some pretty slender threads at times, and that was one of them. I, I personally believe if Lincoln had not won the, that nomination, I think this country would have broken apart. I don't think anybody else had the kind of skills Lincoln had and the endurance to, to hold this country together. Who was promoting Abraham Lincoln? And if you were at the convention, what would have been your choices? Yeah, the, the um, uh, promoting Lincoln were his people in Illinois. This was sort of a hidden weapon Lincoln had. Um, it's interesting, they chose the convention uh, site of Chicago because it was considered neutral ground because no serious candidate came from Illinois, if you can believe that. And uh, uh, But Lincoln had, Lincoln had s suffered repeated defeats. He'd lost the Senate twice. He had only held one two-year term in, in the House, in Congress, and uh, but he had spent years and years working this uh, judicial circuit, traveling from small town to small town and making friends uh, with his, his jokes, his fairness, his integrity, his intelligence. And he had built this loyal cadre of supporters. And when this convention took place, in Chicago, they were they could afford to go to it and, and support him there. But, you know, it was so disorganized. Uh, David Davis, who was the judge in the circuit court, uh, showed up at the convention and discovered nobody had even booked a room for their headquarters. This is how disorganized the Lincoln team was. And he, he immediately uh, managed to bribe some uh, guests to leave the hotel and take over, and he took over as manager at that point. He, nobody appointed him; he just did it. And he was—he didn't sleep the whole week. He was working. Uh, he slept, you know, a, a couple hours or something at a time. But he—he—he he, he worked his heart out to to nominate Lincoln. This um, is the same Dave Davis that ended up being. The vote that tripped to the president, C.D. Rutherford B. Hayes. No, he. I don't believe he. He did that. Well, he was involved in that. Um, well, 
There, I don't there was believe eight, he did that. It, it ended up at eight seven, and we don't need to go into that one. But, right, right. But Davis did. Lincoln did uh, eventually reluctantly nominate David Davis to the Supreme Court, um, and he did it because his Davis's friends went to Lincoln and said, "You wouldn't be sitting in that seat if not for this man." And Lincoln said, hey, "I can't give too many jobs to Illinois," but he finally gave in and put uh, Davis on the court, and he was a pretty good judge. His most famous ruling was actually against Lincoln after Lincoln's death. He, he ruled that uh, uh, civil courts must be used, not uh, military courts, if the courts are available. How much did Abraham Lincoln's people promise <laughs> others in order to get their votes? Yeah, Lincoln's, you know, after the tally sheets weren't available and they adjourned, Lincoln's team went to work and they, I think they sold cabinet seats for uh, support. And uh, Davis later confessed that he promised the same jobs to multiple delegations. <laughs> and a friend of his said, uh, Prevar did you uh, prevaricate then? And he said, prevaricate? I We lied like hell. <laughs> and uh, that's... That's how they got Lincoln in. That's one of the ways. Um, another interesting thing they apparently did was print up counterfeit tickets uh, to the wigwam, and they forged signatures on them of, of Republican officials. So the Seward men who were expecting he'd be easily nominated on Friday went march, uh, went out for a great grand march uh, to the wigwam Friday morning, and when they showed up, their seats were taken by Lincoln men, which is an extra extraordinary thing since the the shouting at the convention uh, theoretically swayed some of the delegates to to support Lincoln. In your book, uh, The Lincoln Miracle on that <clears throat> convention, you, you quote Henry Adams talking about Seward. And it's just interesting to see what he said. He, the eternally cynical and acerbic Adams, you say, grandson of one president and great-grandson of another, was struck by the senator's slouching, slender figure, slender yeah, figure with a head like a wise macaw, a beaked <laughs> nose, shaggy eyebrows, unorderly hair and clothes, hoarse voice, offhand manner, free talk, and a perpetual cigar. What were they writing about Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> yeah, well, Seward, Henry Adams found uh, Seward just fascinating uh, in his storytelling. But Lincoln was even was much cruder than uh, Seward. Obviously, they uh, he was very poorly educated uh, formally. He had. Um, very country mannerisms. He told dirty jokes that deeply offended some reporters. Uh, and he, um, so it, it, he was considered somebody who was a, a tad uncouth in a way. Uh, and I write in the book about the, the delegates, um, the chairman of each delegation going down to Springfield on Saturday, the day after they nominated Lincoln and just to meet him and see this man nominated, some of them were struck by, uh, you know, his country mannerisms and how he looked and everything. But with Lincoln, people were struck by that at first, but then they quickly came around and saw, wait a minute, there's something to this guy. This, uh, this he really projected this sort of charismatic quality where people said, this is a great man even though he had sort of the rumpled suit and the and the uh you know the neck too thin for his collar and all that stuff and his hair flying all over the place and they they quickly saw this is this is someone special go back to when you started all this when when was the first time you decided that you wanted to write a book about Abraham Lincoln how long ago oh, oh gosh um it must have been 20 years ago. And I, you know, I thought about it. I thought about it for a long time. Um, and, you know, the book, the first book on Lincoln came out three years ago. I thought about it for a long time. And I 
And it just struck me, all these famous people walking into the story on uh, that day. And I thought, let me let me write that. And I, I had a heck, as any writer will tell you, I had a heck of a time placing it with a publisher. But I finally, Grove Atlantic, uh, liked this idea and, and ran with it. You're, and you're it talking did. about the second inaugural. That, your yes. first book, yeah. Yes, and and uh, it did very well. I mean, it was uh, it's one of those things where um, I guess it's a hard concept to sell to people, but it when they grasp it, it's it does very well. So, do you think a lot of, of Lincoln experts in your acknowledgments? But the reason I bring that up is how do you how did you protect yourself with eighteen thousand books or whatever the number <laughs> is? You know what the Lincoln community is like. There's yes. a tremendous amount of competition. They yes. all, and there is some cat fighting among them. Uh, there are different organizations and all that. How did you protect yourself from being criticized for getting it wrong? Yeah, I, I ran it by some Lincoln experts, but the, the new one I really ran by um, some great, great Lincoln scholars like Michael Burlingame, who's the president of the Abraham Lincoln Association. And he he went over it and God, he saved me from making some stupid mistakes or he, he said, well, well, maybe you want to explore this perspective. And, and that I find this immensely helpful. I've been incredibly fortunate in the people I've met. I I know Gordon Wood well. He's to me, he's my hero. He's, you know, the greatest American historian of the Revolutionary period. And how and, much uh, of that, by the way, is because you were vice president and editorial page editor of the Providence Journal, and he is at he, Brown. He's at Brown, so I just, you know, I just decided to try to bef befriend him, and he's the most modest generous guy i mean he he he's just been terrific um and i found that same thing with michael burlingame um these people who i really revere are turn out to be very gentle humble people i was in uh, springfield the other day and um uh at a, at a conference a symposium and somebody came up with a copy of my book and said uh would you sign this for me? And I said, sure. What's your, what's your name? And he said, well, call me Doug, Doug. And he said, you said nice things about me in my last <laughs> book, in your last book. It turns out to be Douglas Wilson, who is, you know, a tremendous Lincoln scholar. So these people, you know, it's, that's one of the wonderful things I've been able to experience. I've spent years and years in the company of Abraham Lincoln, but I've also met these historians who are just, you know, great. How many Lincoln places have you been to? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't been to Indiana. I've been to his birthplace in Kentucky, and I've been all over Springfield, and I've been to the uh, towns and cities he went to as a as a lawyer. Uh, but I haven't been to Indiana. I got to get there because that that was where his formative period of growth was as a, a boy and a young man. So what what about a, the subject matter? How, how were you initially off in another direction and changed to the uh, second inaugural? And if that's the case, what, where were you headed first? Well, it's funny when I, I, I wrote my first book, of, which was called 59 and 84, about a major league pitcher he's in the hall of fame who won 59 games in a single season and i wanted to write about how a human being could do that um and so i he and he pitched for the providence grays of the national league and providence was the city i was in as a newspaper editor so uh, but i had a dream uh right after i wrote that book the, about a, the, my next book being called wigwam and I had a picture, <laughs> I can still see the cover in my dream. I said, well, I got to write that someday. So I put that aside and then I wrote the uh, second inaugural book first. And then I said, well, why don't I write the wigwam book? And that's what I did. What was the reaction in 1865 at the second inaugural and after in the newspapers? Because I know you did a lot of work in your profession, reading 
newspapers from that time. Yeah, it's, well, to me, the most dramatic discovery I made writing that first book was how much Lincoln was disliked and hated by much of the country. I mean, it's extraordinary. We have, we view him as this sort of sainted figure who was widely admired, which he is, but in, in his day, he was vilified. And a lot of the, and it was very partisan, uh, as partisan as we are today, um, Democratic newspapers regarded that speech with horror. He's, uh, they made fun of him for saying with malice toward none, with charity for all, because he was prosecuting this very vicious war, uh, including Sherman's campaign in, uh, in the South, which was still going on where he was just uh, tearing through the South and destroying their ability to grow food and all, all sorts of stuff um, and almost terrorizing the people of the South. So uh, the, the Democratic papers thought, many of them thought it was outrageous that Lincoln was referring to uh, the Almighty and, and his Lincoln's argument in the second inauguration was that this, the length of this war, nobody could understand the ferocity of this war that occurred. Uh, nobody knew going into the war what would happen. And Lincoln was troubled during the war that how long it took to win this war. And he finally concluded one explanation might be that the Almighty dragged out this war until slavery was finally eradicated. And it had to be this way. Um, and uh, many Democratic papers, Southern papers were horrified, but Democratic papers in the North thought, how dare this politician speak about God's will and his uh, understanding of God's will, we should leave God out of it and so forth. So that was a very unpopular speech and very few people initially grasped how brilliant it was. Um, but then it, it became a sacred text of American history, and it's engraved in stone at the Lincoln uh, Lincoln Memorial. In your first book, um, you have a, let me see if I can find it. It takes a little bit to read this, <clears throat> but it really cuts through the language. And this is the letter in your prologue from a Southern officer, uh, to address any Union soldier. Now, this is the, t the tough time. These books are in two different ones, and you know, after the second election, and ones before he's elected in 1860. Right. So it can be a bit confusing for people listening. But these two books uh, have a lot of this kind of thing in it. This one, I want to read it. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the language as it's spoken, but uh, you can get the message. This again from a Southern officer, written after, right near the end of the war. You GD bloody, Negro stealing, cowardly SOB. I hope your damn brain, more than it is now, may become the abode of the vile pest, 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 pestiferous. Thank you, pestiferous <laughs> vermin, that your skulking eyes may gangrene and wither in their sockets, that your damn lying tongue may f fester and cleave to the roof of your shameless mouth, that your damned canting throat may become tremors for nothing but loathsome pus, that your Yankee intestines may uh, putrefy, may your damned paunch fill with boils and cancer and abscesses, and I send an eternal carcass odor to your damned codfish-plied nostrils. In fact, that you yourself, you dirty villain, may land in the seventh hell and blister forever. Come, that came from a Southern officer. How much does that say about the divide? And how much more of that did you read as you were doing oh, your yeah. preparation? Uh, this, this country was brutally divided. And um, to me, that's the, I mean, I, I wrote, I tried to bring in as much as I could about the, the feelings of average Americans across the spectrum that day which was very divided. And even in the North, people didn't think that highly of Lincoln. And 
to me that you need that backdrop to understand the speech which is reaching out to both sides saying uh let's end the self-righteousness let's let's try to work together to to bind up these wounds and and move forward and i can think of no other politician than lincoln delivering that speech um every other politician i can think of would speak about you know the sacrifices of the war but we're on the verge of victory and this is a great thing and Lincoln didn't do that. He he spoke about the need for both sides to come together and uh, move forward somehow. And I think he appealed to Almighty God because that was the one thing that uh, both sides shared. It was a very religious country, and they overwhelmingly Christian, and they they shared a belief that God acted out in the lives of people. And um, so that's what he was reaching toward. We were both sides were wrong. Both sides got into this war not expecting what it would be, and we have to move forward the best we can. We we don't know everything. We can't judge each other harshly. And to me, that's that's like nothing else in in history, in American history. What did it's very it Christ like? What did Abraham Lincoln think of Sherman's march through the South, through Atlanta, the slaughtering that went on? What was his attitude about that? I think he was, Lincoln was very compassionate, but he was also believed the war had to end as soon as possible. And he was willing to engage in total warfare to make that happen. Um, you know, there's often questions, what would what would Lincoln have done in World War II in Harry Truman's shoes? Would he have dropped the bomb? And I think he would have. He want, in the, in the Civil War, he wanted to end that war as soon as possible. He understood that civilians would be suffering terribly, uh, but this had to be ended. It had to be ended and we had to move forward. Go back again to 1860. I asked this question earlier and we got on another track. Oh, probably, <clears throat> but yeah. How many candidates were there in front oh, of the yes. convention? And who could we have voted? What were their names that we people we could have voted for? Yeah, the, well, there were multiple candidates. It depends on how you define a candidate. They just, all sorts of people went in uh, expressing an interest. Um, and the candidates weren't there at the convention at the time. They were. They stayed away and their managers ran things. But the the most prominent moderate alternative to Seward, I think, was not Lincoln, but this guy named Edward Bates, who was a judge from Missouri. He was very sort of conservative. He didn't he didn't like the Republican Party much. He didn't like all this what he called agitation about slavery. He wanted the two sides to to get along with each other. Uh, and he wanted to gloss over slavery a little bit. And so he was he was being pushed by a very prominent um, newspaper editor, Horace Greeley, pro the most the most influential newspaper editor in the country. And Bates went you know, went into that convention thinking he had it in the bag uh, because he presented a moderate alternative to Seward. So he was a major candidate. Um, Salmon P. Chase was of Ohio was a major candidate. Um, there were other people. Uh, uh, Edward Bank, Bank, Nathaniel Banks from Massachusetts, other other people, uh, and Lincoln was just one in a group of many. There was a uh, elderly uh, Supreme Court Judge McLean who was his son was there madly pushing and uh lincoln was very fond of him but he thought he was too old uh so there were all all sorts of people uh eventually bates was um brought down because he was associated with the know nothing party which was uh, a, the american party which was sort of viewed immigrants as a threat to american culture and especially the large numbers of immigrants and they thought democrats were using them to uh steal elections and control uh politics 
So, um, uh, but the, the, uh, there were German American voters in the immigrants and, uh, they, they had a very small percentage of Republican votes, but they could swing elections in a number of Northern states because they were so close. So they had their own convention in Chicago the same week, a national convention in Chicago, right down the road from, um, right down the road from the wigwam, basically. And they did it basically to send a warning to these delegates, don't nominate Bates or we'll walk. And uh, so that was another thing that slotted into place perfectly for Lincoln. Lincoln was not uh, known as, as an enemy. Uh, he was not known as uh, either a great supporter of the immigrants or an enemy of them. Uh, in truth, he was uh, an enemy of the Know Nothing Party, and he believed strongly in supporting in immigrants and immigration. Uh, but he, but he wasn't as uh, prominent as Seward in that way. So he was he sort of fit in perfectly in the middle between Seward and Bates. The election itself, running against four people, three people at least. Abraham yeah. Lincoln, Stephen A. Douglas, John Breckinridge, who had been vice president, and John Bell. He, here's, though, a quote that I wanted your reaction to. You quote Dave Davis, who ran the yep. campaign for Abraham Lincoln, as saying the following. I consider Douglas, that's Stephen A. Douglas, an Illinoisan, the most arrogant demagogue that ever disgraced humanity. What's that <laughs> quote all about, and what did Stephen A. Douglas say about slavery? Well, uh, Steve, Stephen A. Douglas was the senator from Illinois, and Lincoln famously ran against him in 1858, and they had their series of, of debates. And uh, Lincoln lost that election, but he sort of positioned uh, Douglas in a way that it made it very difficult for him to win the Democratic nomination in 1860. Um, D Douglas, Douglas tried to uh, he pushed this thing called popular sovereignty, where voters in territories could either vote slavery up or down, and uh, he thought this would solve the slavery issue and put it on, off the table, and then he might be able to win uh, votes in the South and be the nominee for the Democrats. But it turned out to be, a, I think, a total disaster. Uh, the, it, it sort of inaugurated the Civil War ahead of the Civil War. People would go, most famously Kansas, people on both sides of the slavery issue flooded into Kansas and started engaging in violent attacks on each other uh, in the course of all this voting up or down slavery. And Lincoln viewed this as horrible because he viewed slavery as something that was morally wrong and you can't just say oh this can be voted up or down he he had a view that the founders had set slavery on a p ultimate path to its uh, demise and they didn't support slavery he thought and uh, he wanted to uh, preserve that approach let's uh, let's oppose slavery morally we have to permit it where it exists but let's sort of strangle it and not allow it to spread to the territories. And this was the difference between these two people. Um, you know, Horace Greeley, who I mentioned earlier, kind of half supported Douglas because Douglas uh, was fighting with the Democratic president, Buchanan. Well, this gets into the weeds, but um, uh, Douglas was sort of trying to position himself between the really extreme Democrats and the and the Republicans, and he, he just ended up infuriating both sides. So what happened in 1860 was the Democratic Party split in half. It couldn't hold together, and that was that really presaged the end of the uh, the division of the Union. Uh, and a, a, so you had a Northern and Southern Democratic candidate against Lincoln, the Republican, and also a the former Whigs, uh, which was the party that predated that Lincoln belonged to before the Republicans, they they uh, formed this union party and advanced a candidate who tried to just ignore uh, 
slavery and just preserve the union all you can. So it was a it was a very divided country. And Lincoln won uh, handily in the Electoral College because he was immensely popular in the North. Northerners were fed up with the South by 1860. They were fed up with all the antics in Congress. They were fed up with violent attacks against uh, Republicans in Congress. Uh, they were fed up with censorship in the South. And Lincoln did extraordinarily well in the Electoral College, but he only wound up with 39% of the popular vote, which was the second lowest total for a president in American history to this day. It might be worth, because you have these figures in your book, <clears throat> yeah, and it'd take a little bit to read them, but rem we should remind everybody that only white men voted and 81% yes. of the white men voted in that particular election in 1860. That's right. Lincoln got 39.8%. Stephen A. Douglas got 29.5%. John Breckinridge got 18.1%. And John Bell got 12.6%. But that doesn't tell the same story when it comes to the Electoral College, as you point out. Abraham Lincoln had 180. Breckinridge, 72. John Bell, 39, and Stephen A. Douglas only got 12 electoral votes, but he got 1.3 million votes, which was the highest except for Abraham Lincoln at 1.8 million. Right. All of those candidates, and I wanted to ask you about this, were from the Midwest. Illinois, two of them. One was from Tennessee, and Breckenridge was from Kentucky. What does that say? Well, it says it says in part that the power in the in the country was was heading west uh, at that time. Um, the the current president was from Pennsylvania, Buchanan, uh, and so it had moved. Uh, th there was that was the area where power was spreading, and also that was the swing area. These these were areas with uh, swing voters. Uh, so it was very important to have candidates who could uh, win there. What's your own background? Where did you come from originally? Oh, I grew up in uh, Westboro, Massachusetts, outside of Worcester. Uh, I went to uh, Westboro High School. I, I went to Boston College. Uh, I don't have any advanced degrees, which makes me odd as a, as a, as a historian. I don't have a PhD. Uh, I was in journalism. I, I started covering local meetings, which I think was valuable in, in teaching me about American politics and the way it's supposed to work. And then I, I, I worked in Washington for a few years in a newspaper bureau. Which one? There. And which one here? What was, it was Hart Hanks Newspapers, which had newspapers in Massachusetts and Texas. Uh, and uh, it was in the... 1980s, a long time ago, but uh, of course that in, that greatly informed my understanding of politics and history. And I used to go to the Library of Congress every night after work and go through the newspaper files and look at uh, the baseball stuff because I was doing a baseball uh, baseball research. So. Um, and then I was an editor of a paper in Lawrence, Massachusetts, uh, Lawrence Eagle Tribune, and I came down to the Providence Journal from there. And uh, what I kind of shape it. is the Providence Journal in today in this environment we're living in? Oh, it's it's. Um, I don't want to say anything bad about it, but it's a shadow of what it was when I was there. It had three hundred people in the newsroom and now I think it's in the single digits or maybe a little higher. Um, the newspaper industry has just been savaged uh, and it's terrible. It It's, I don't know how we can survive as a, as a culture without, um, without the sources of news that we used to have, um, especially at the local level. Um, so it's, it's very sad to me, very sad. Well, back in 1860, there was a Thurlow Weed and a Horace Greeley, uh, and, and, and many others who were in the newspaper business. How much influence did they have then compared to what the media has today? 
uh, they were enormously influential. I think the media is very influential today in, in a way, but it's uh, uh, these people were deeply involved in politics. It was a different nature. Well, the the media was uh, the newspapers in the nineteenth century century were openly partisan. So you would have a Democratic paper in, in, in a city and a Republican paper or a Whig paper or whatever. And these editors did not uh, hold any objective standards. They And they participated openly in politics. Greeley, for example, uh, wanted to be lieutenant governor of New York. He served a, a short term in Congress um, where he made himself a pain to everybody there. And then he wanted to be Lieutenant Governor of New York. And this was really the source of his fight with Seward and Weed. They, they advanced, instead of uh, Greeley, they advanced the editor of the New York Times, Henry Raymond, who became <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. And Greeley was just furious because he had, he had supported Seward and Weed for his his journalistic career up to that point. They were considered the triumvirate. They were considered a very powerful force. And so he went to this convention in Chicago talking to all the delegates. You got you can't support Seward. He's going to go down to defeat. He's too radical. Uh, you got to go with Bates or somebody else. And this, this was another thing that worked in Lincoln's uh, favor at that convention. And it's, and it, I think it traces back to to his political ambitions and his his fight with Seward and Weed. One of my favorite uh, pages in your book uh, on the second inaugural <clears throat> was chapter five, and I want to read it because uh, it gives good insight into the human being Abraham Lincoln, and it comes from John Hay, his aide and former Secretary of State. I'll read it. Um, he uh, usually came generally about 7 o'clock in the mornings when he showed up uh, to start his day. He worked quietly in his White House office for a while before taking breakfast at around 8. He usually had a cup of coffee and an egg, maybe a piece of toast. He might eat an apple. He was very esteemous, ate less than anyone I know, his secretary, John Hay, noted. In a country notorious for its heavy drinking, Lincoln never touched liquor and did not seem to care all that much about food. These are your quotes. He suffered from poor digestion and frequent constipation and for a time treated the problem by taking blue mass pills, a laxative laced with mercury, which seemed to have him more, made him irritable and I'm unable to sleep at night. He told a friend he quit the medicine early into his presidency because it made him cross. He also skipped meals unintentionally, prone to get lost in thought. He could forget to eat. Your response to all that? Yeah, I, I love those kind of details. Um, this is really the way, uh, the, the reason I write history the way I do. I it's called sort my editor calls it micro history but i i look at a, a very narrow period of history and i try to tell you everything uh, tell the reader everything i can about uh the details of that day and the people and i think when you bring it down to that level from you know the usual omniscient historical view is thirty thousand feet up and we know what's going to happen and we know uh the general themes and everything but when you go down to the narrow level of uh, what they were like, what they were eating, what they, what happened that day, uh, you get a feeling that these are real human beings. They they're just like you and me. They they don't know what's going to happen next. They they don't have this sort of uh, historical knowledge that uh, everything's going to happen a certain way. So I try to capture that in these books. That you know, at this moment we don't know what's going to happen next and even though we do know from history uh i think it's really a an interesting way to look at these people and sort of understand history the way it was felt at least i try to do that on the on the downside you talk about lincoln had used every weapon he could to get his hands on 
massive borrowing, the nation's first federal income tax, the jailing of journalists, the imposition of martial law across the nation with the use of military tribunals to imprison tens of thousands of civilians who were suspected of making trouble. What, in, in, from your perspective, what, what did he do wrong? Well, uh, I, I, I still struggle with uh, some of the things he did in terms of civil rights during that war. Um, but I generally come down with the view articulated by uh, historian Mark Neely in his famous uh, book, The Fate of Liberty, which is that when the whole country's falling down around your ears, you have to do some things that uh, you might not do in, uh, in a country where at peace. So I think Lincoln uh did it did permit his people to engage in some activities that th threaten constitutional liberties um but i think lincoln was not inherently a tyrant i think he was a somebody who loved this country and its freedoms and he wanted to preserve them so that's where i come down it's it but it's it's a very cloudy murky dark area i mean and he was acting at a time when he didn't know it was this country was going to survive. And, and he, his goal was keeping the country uh, alive and not permitting the South to split off. Do you have another Lincoln book in you? I want to do one third micro history Lincoln book and then then move on to something else. Um, so I'm. I'm mulling that over right now um what do you mean by I, micro history well just looking at a narrow period of time in his administration um so that so i can just bring up uh what he was dealing with what the country was dealing with at that moment and really shine a light on a particular moment that i think is is very important and that's what i tried to do in these two books the first book Edward Acorn wrote was Every Drop of Blood, the momentous second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. And the second one, which is just out, is The Lincoln Miracle Inside the Republican Convention That Changed History. That was 1860. And Edward Acorn, we thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Brian. It's been such an honor to be here. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.